everyone, Katya here. This video is primarily for libertarians, centrists, independents, disenfranchised and alienated right-wingers, but particularly and especially for right libertarians, as well as for leftists who don't know much about those groups or how to interact with them, you know, to like sharpen your rhetorical skills when talking to those groups. Just a note, I am well aware there is a huge difference between ANCAPs and minarchists, but for convenience and because ANCAPs have taken over libertarian dialogue, I will be using right libertarian and ANCAP interchangeably. To the centrist and independent who feels there is something deeply wrong with how the left-right divide is typically expressed, I see you, I hear you, no one has addressed your concerns or represented you, and it is disheartening. To the conservative becoming disenfranchised, maybe you have given up on conservatism, but more likely it gave up on you. You wanted limited government and a wholesome society where you could just live in peace with your family, but what were you given? An authoritarian and cold monster. Maybe you realize that limiting government doesn't work when you're telling people what they can do in their bedrooms or defending military expansionism. Which brings us to the libertarian. It is you I will be addressing the most in this video, as you have specific proposed solutions that are often echoed by all the other demographics listed to one extent or another, more often than you are given credit for. You have an absolutely understandable and, may I add, not entirely inaccurate fear of government overreach and abuse of power. Some of you are likely disappointed about the far-right shift your movement took in the Trump years and desperately want it back. Others may be in that dangerous state of anger that led to those dark changes. In either case, I see you. People mock you, use your ideology as a pejorative, and yet in the USA, the party of your ideology always comes in third. And anyone who doesn't see you have influenced policy is choosing not to look. I take you seriously. I was you. And while I am a leftist now, you may be surprised to learn I myself am still a libertarian. Not a right libertarian by any means, but a libertarian nonetheless. That being said, while I will be predominantly discussing libertarians, right libertarians, all groups above will likely glean something useful from this video. You may think since I'm a leftist I want to take your guns and aim in your fun away. You may think I want to take your porn away. But no no, rest assured, on the Katya Odinson channel, Absolute support for gun rights and OPI tags are non-negotiable. And of course we can agree on some things. Keynesian economics is irresponsible and ridiculous at best and authoritarian at worst. However, I don't want to sugarcoat anything. I want you to know I see you, but as of right now, we are not allies. The reason being, the world you seek to create is one in which me and mine are, n are not going to do so well. And as you are quick to point out, self-interest is rational. The good news is, I plan to offer some mutually beneficial solutions in which you can become my ally. Plus, how often do you get the chance to have an honest conversation with a mask-off communist girl? Granted, I don't tend to mask my views, as they are actually not objectionable. You tend to find that on the left. Little bit about me, I was raised conservative, and the values I was taught as someone raised in the LDS cult were particularly conservative. But as I got older, I flirted with anarcho-communism, and particularly with anarcho-primitivism. So while I flirted with theory a, a little, reading Bookchin excerpts here and there, and watching the occasional Noam Chomsky lectures, etc., I was more interested in getting away from civilization, and I did where I could, making tents out of sticks in the summer, etc. But eventually there was one argument that got me away from primitivism that I still think is pretty adequate, and holds up, which is that anarcho-primitivism is ableist, in that without things like modern medicine, etc., many people will die. Worth noting that a lot of trans people would die in an anprim society as well, due to not having access to many of the things we need. And yes, I'm trans, feel free to leave your one singular joke from that ancient copypasta in the comments. But as I was not particularly interested in theory at that point, I was also susceptible to a weak argument. Anarcho-communism can exist within anarcho-capitalism, but anarcho-capitalism can't exist within anarcho-communism. So clearly, ANCAPs are better advocates of freedom than anarcho-communists. A reductio I was exposed to a few years later works pretty well, which was, post-leftism can't exist in anarcho-capitalism due to the NAP suppressing the unique from a post-left perspective, so there are forms of anarchism that cannot coexist within anarcho-capitalism too. Shout out to Cody Smoker for that reductio. Funny enough, I would later meet many post-leftists, like my friend Jeffrey, as well as join a group of other people, and these people were borderline ANCAPs, who happened to like some post-leftist theorists, such as Max Stirner, or a leftist theorist like Kevin Carson, 
And that group eventually became, as you can imagine, a reactionaries in recovery group in the early process of my disambiguation and deconstruction of right libertarian thought. Good group, good people, good times all around, much love. Cody's use of reductio ad absurdum is sufficient to refute the argument, but the argument has other issues as well. It assumes the premises and subsequent conclusions of the ANCAP position are true. Let's examine that, shall we? So ANCAPs think taxation is theft. It may surprise you to learn I do not dispute this, or perhaps that it is extortion. As an anarchist myself, I have no reason to. We can agree that the state is a territorial monopoly on coercion, and as right libertarians are quick to point out, if it's not theft or extortion, try not paying it. Sure, I'll grant that. But remember what Milton Friedman's quote on inflation was? That it's an oddly specific fed it- Oh, whoops, wrong notes. Ah, here it is. That inflation is taxation without legislation. That's something I can agree to as well. But what if I told you there was another hidden tax? The government absolutely does exploit and extract value based on labor against people's will just for occupying a space. There is no choice involved. And right libs are quick to point out if taxation is theft, try not paying it, see what happens. Okay, so what about rent? Rent is theft and extortion. Don't believe me? Try not paying it. See what happens. You see, rent is handled in the same way taxation is and gives rise to systems every bit as usurious as taxation. You have been duped into hating the government that you can see while ignoring or even defending the same immoral behavior of the state you don't. After all, what is the state if not a landlord? It demands you extract the product of your labor to live in a territory in perpetuity. Well, what does a landlord do? Exactly the same thing. You see, dear right libertarian, not only is rent a hidden tax, but taxation itself is rent. You can try to refute this by saying, well, a landlord often puts labor into the property initially, a retort I often see. Interesting that you're approaching the socialist-specific labor theory of value with that claim, but how does that grant ownership to a space that the landlord has sufficiently abandoned? What gives a landlord a right to coerce you to live in a space that you are doing all or most of the upkeep on? A person putting up walls and a ceiling they have touched very little, if at all, in like 30 or more years, does not justify extorting and living off the labor of the resident, who is actually using the space, nor to threaten them with force if they refuse to leave the space that you are not using. It is much better, therefore, for us to take the mutualist position that ownership is defined by use and occupancy. Any other definition is inconsistent for those who condemn coercion. There is no way to condemn the coercive nature of taxation consistently without also condemning rent. Note, some intuition is at play, but there are things you can use to claim a space, like databases or good old-fashioned notes, but leaving a space to go on vacation for a bit or to go to the co-op to get some food is not abandoning a space. For a space to be sufficiently abandoned, you make it clear you have no intention of using it yourself. But forcing people who occupy a space you are not using and do not intend to use is absolutely extracting resources in the form of wealth at the expense of others utilizing the initiation of coercion. You see, you're almost there. Your outrage at the state for taking from you without your consent, what you worked for causing you to cry out against taxation, is not an entirely invalid feeling. You know you're being stolen from, and make no mistake, you are by the state to live in a place you are using that they are likely not, by mortgage lenders if you're lucky enough to own a home, who are forcing you to pay to live in a space that you are using that they are not, by landlords who are forcing you to pay to live in a space you are using that they are not. You're upset that your means of production are being taken from you. You want to seize back your means of production. You want to access the facilities and resources to produce your own goods. I don't blame you. But as I have demonstrated, that goes well beyond the government. Taxation is a symptom of poor resource allocation, not the cause of the problem. Even Murray Rothbard argued for the expropriation or seizing of the means of production at one point in the confiscation and the homesteading principle in 1969. Not only that, but far-right Austrian economist and social conservative proprietarian darling of the alt-right Hans Hermann Hoppe concedes that Marxist class analysis is basically correct in Chapter 4 of The Economics and Ethics of Private Property. Side note for any pagans watching, especially if you are on the right, Hoppe hates you. 
That's what he meant by expelling nature worshippers. He meant animists. Great year into being political. Check out my friend Ocean's video on that. Mind you, the views expressed in this video don't represent Ocean's, despite us both being progressive. But you picked a side that hates you. Plus, half of you are gay anyway. What are you thinking? Drop the ludicrous and absurd folkist bullshit and start allying with people who, you know, maybe don't want you to die? But back to the topic at hand. Yeah, Hoppe does some mental gymnastics to come to a different conclusion than the evidence lies. But I must ask right libertarians, if someone as far right as Hoppe could concede that class analysis as understood by the left to be basically accurate, and anarcho-capitalism's founder, Murray Rothbard, could concede the need to seize the means of production, what is stopping so many of you from making similar concessions? Now, not all do, but more often than not, right libertarians will advocate for supply-side economics, an economic theory that proposes cutting taxes and reducing regulation on companies, stimulates market growth, and creates jobs. Of course, someone who believes taxation is theft, who hasn't thought much more of the other forms of economic theft, rent, would find this appealing, but unfortunately it doesn't have any bearing in reality. 2020 paper Hope and Limburg, The Economic Consequences of Major Tax Cuts in the Rich, observed 18 countries over a span of 50 years and concluded, Our analysis finds strong evidence that cutting taxes on the rich increases income inequality, but has no effect on growth or unemployment. You see, the issue with taxation is that it is a subset of rent. Criticize rent, and you get critique of taxation thrown in. Criticize taxation alone, and you help corporations enrich themselves, ultimately making yourself less free and the state more powerful. If you want to be more free, taxation should not be your singular target. Ask yourself, in your personal life, which thing makes you as an individual less free? Taxes, or something you pay a large portion of your income every month that increases by the year. I don't like the progressive tax much either, but the evidence shows corporate tax breaks increase income inequality and of course do nothing but help the bigger menace, the state, which as we all know, is by and large beholden to corporations and vice versa, as the state is symbiotic with corporations and both are parasitic towards the people. Odd to concede though, you actually do seem to believe in the possibility of post-scarcity? Might I suggest you just follow scholarly and academic methodology to get there instead of long debunked ideas made up by wealthy American politicians? So here we come to two issues to reconcile. Polycentric organization, which ANCAPs particularly often defend, and their right libertarian conception of rights. Rights according to ANCAPs being property rights, as right libertarian tendency sees all rights as an extension of property usually defining this through self-ownership. Trouble with self-ownership is it implies the self is property to be bought and sold. I'd opt to advocate for self-autonomy instead if you want to avoid viewing humans as, you know, property, which, like, we're not. Yikes. You won't hear me defending any type of monocentric government here. I, like most mutualists, do also advocate polycentric organization, not monocentric. That's something that we can agree on. And even better news, polycentric organization has been demonstrated empirically to be effective. See Eleanor Ostrom's Beyond Markets and States, Polycentric Governance of Complex Economic Systems. So there is ample reason to believe polycentric organization not only works, but works better than monocentric structures in many cases. For the layman outside of 12 inches of dick deep into right lib versus left lib discourse, polycentric governance means there are multiple structures rather than a singular state or corp governing laws. It's arguably distinct from, but similar to, the classical anarchist idea of confederation. But ANCAPs seek to establish this method in a way that is frankly counterintuitive, wanting these structures to, at least typically, be consistent of top-down firms. An issue also occurs upon careful reading of Ostrom's research in that it implies suspicion of property in general. In fact, Schlager and Ostrom's paper Workshops in Political Theory on Policy Analysis concluded, the development of effective property rights systems to manage inshore fisheries is extraordinarily difficult no matter what type of property rights regime is adopted. Assuming full ownership rights does not guarantee an avoidance of resource degradation and overinvestment. Upon learning this, Ostrom seemed not particularly perturbed. So we can grant polycentric organization as empirically practical, but even so, property rights within polycentric organization 
is something we have to remain entirely agnostic about, the need for, or even the efficacy of. So this leaves right libertarians, particularly ANCAPs, in a precarious position. They either have to concede to believing in monocentric coercive government to maintain property, or they have to give up polycentric order, despite polycentric order being proven to be advantageous. The best solution, therefore, would be to just move left. Not only that, but Ostrom herself, upon discovering her eight principles for managing the commons, those principles being define clear group boundaries, match rules governing use of common goods to local needs and conditions, ensure that those affected by the rules can participate in modifying the rules, make sure the rule-making rights of community members are respected by outside authorities, develop a system carried out by community members for monitoring members' behavior, use graduated sanctions for rule violators, provide accessible low-cost means for dispute resolution, and build responsibility for governing the common resource in the nested tiers from the lowest level up to the entire interconnected system. Ostrom preferred a bottom-up approach to organizing. No reason to opt for the top-down firms and caps usually defend. Why go with a firm anyway when you can go with a co-op? Not only did Ostrom recommend organization not be top-down, but the evidence suggests you should put that bottom up and get ready for some fucking socialism because we know from the evidence, unlike property rights, which are no more than a non-essential unknown at best, that co-ops are not any less efficient than capitalist firms. In fact, it seems they are more efficient. In the book, The Cooperative Business Movement, 1950 to the Present, Chapter 8, Virginie Perrotin's empirical research found, this overview of the empirical evidence on the performance of worker cooperatives suggests both that worker cooperatives perform well in comparison with conventional firms and that the features that make them special, worker participation and unusual arrangements for the ownership of capital, are part of their strength. So, if we're going to go with what the evidence says about polycentricity, it would behoove us to do the same with co-ops. Not only that, top-down firms are coercive in that they force you to sell your labor for less than it is worth, causing you to do more work often times than your employer for less profit. Work under these coercive property norms, even though it is not the only or best way to do it, or else die, is an ultimatum, not a choice. The same issue is not found, however, within co-ops. Personally, I'd take this whole concept a step further and into worker abolition, but that's a conversation for another time. Now, we need to talk a little bit about freedom of association. Giving wealthy business owners and landlords freedom to turn away anyone from establishments they have dictatorship over will likely kill marginalized people. Who are the people most likely to be successful? White conservative Christians. Why? Simple. Because they're the majority. Putting systems in place, like what ANCAPs propose, that allow business owners to discriminate based on antisocial lines, in addition to being extremely regressive and reactionary, will obviously put the most vulnerable people at risk needlessly. Wanting freedom requires suspicion of power, and giving people with power in the form of dynamics such as a business owner or a landlord absolutely puts the most vulnerable people at risk. We already saw small elements of this under Trump with LGBTQIA plus rights being peeled back and the rise in racism. Do you really want more of that than Trump? The question freedom for who matters. And even if you try to cop out with freedom for all, that implies for those of disadvantaged status because they are not as free of others, that is no freedom. Edwards and Ruchin's 2018 study, The Effect on President Trump's Election on Hate Crimes, concluded, Using the data from this study, we offer a novel theory that builds on the existing literature on the causes of hate crimes. We hypothesize that it was not just Trump's inflammatory rhetoric throughout the political campaign that caused hate crimes to increase. Rather, we argue that it was Trump's subsequent election as president of the United States that validated this rhetoric in the eyes of the perpetrators and fueled the hate crime surge. So we can see from the evidence when people feel justified in their beliefs and are given power, they are more likely to use it. Economic power is real. There is no reason to believe this would be less true of a landlord who can easily find another tenant than an elected official. People will do business with who they are comfortable with. Why do you want a landlord to be able to force people not to have shelter based on a dislike of things they can't help? What on earth would possess someone to trust another human being with that much power? If you seek freedom, 
you must be suspicious of all power, economic and political. It's not enough to say you want freedom if you are opposed to liberation. If you are a gender, romantic, or sexual minority, or a black or indigenous person of color, the right wants you dead. Not only that, they'll tell you, No, we changed our minds about you long ago, and anyone telling you otherwise is just trying to tokenize you to get votes. Bull shit. They are manipulating you. It's a gaslight. They did it to me so they could at me on social media to tokenize me to progressives so they could prove, see, there is a person right here who agrees with me who isn't heterosexual. So much for the tolerant left. So they can cry about mean and toxic leftists who call the spade a spade. Don't let them make a fool out of you. We all saw the erosion of rights of GRSM people under Trump. We saw the rise in racism. Do not be a fool. That being said, why did so many libertarians turn to the alt-right? Well, it stems from the fact that Pierre Joseph Proudhon, one of the first libertarians, and a left libertarian anarchist, I might add, had many heated and interesting debates with Karl Marx that make selective readings like his quote, The doctrinaire, authoritarian, dictatorial, governmental communist system is based on the principle that the individual is essentially subordinate to the collective. Never mind, at another time, he referred to his own ideology as a synthesis between communism and property, and the above criticism literally can't be applied to some forms of communism, such as anarcho-communism, but it makes for great Red Scare propaganda, and fascists knew that. Despite the fact that Proudhon was an opponent of nationalism and the state, and while certainly not perfect, and at times, yes, problematic, I actually recommend Kevin Carson and Peter Kropotkin over Marx and Proudhon, Proudhon though he could not be described as a fascist, was the namesake of the so-called National Syndicalist Party, known as Circle Proudhon in 1911, which would be an influence in other fascist understanding. The nationalist, pro-government, and anti-Semitic rhetoric of this party, as well as its entryism into libertarian circles, would serve as a precursor to other fascist movements as well as their tactics, which by the way persist today, despite the eventual collapse of that party. It wasn't just mutualism they infiltrated, of course. Ideas from another Lipsoak school were also manipulated, most notably syndicalism. While I myself operate on a synthesis of mutualism and anarcho-communism, syndicalism is and always has been pretty good leftist theory. Make no mistake, there are certainly things I would dispute from my position from thinkers such as Noam Chomsky, but syndicalism absolutely has its place as part of the greater part of leftist theory and as a practice. And it, as a practice, can be quite useful in starting revolution. But as what happened with Proudhon, entryists took advantage here as well. They saw the utility of things like the general strike and the power held, and co-opted mutualism and syndicalism for nefarious purposes, despite being neither at all even remotely. It's true that the first formulation of fascism was partially inspired by George Sorrell's heterodoxic Marxist ideas of myth, but that was merged with Charles Morris's extremely nationalistic, anti-Semitic, and explicitly reactionary ideas. The result? Systems that banned trade unions and banned worker strikes, monopolized industry, and gave control to a massive and centralized government. This is what the far right does. Let me be clear. Fascists are not and were not and never will be leftists. Fascists did not and do not view themselves as leftists. Fascism has always presented itself as far right, as a far right third option opposing communism and capitalism. It's impossible to sell traditionalism on its surface, so it tries to present itself as something new and unique. This is why any ostensibly weird political movements are fascist entryist breeding grounds. It steals theory from the left, because the right doesn't really have any theory, and uses it to justify institutions that are explicitly incompatible with any leftist or anarchist concepts as a method to defend something much, much farther right than any usual classical liberal could ever find themselves on. Even before there were right libs, libertarians have always been a target for entryists because our politics are weird. But I hate to break it to you, right libs, unlike us leftists who were infiltrated, your peeps invited to court it. Ludwig von Mises wrote in his 1927 book, Liberalism, 
It cannot be denied that fascism and similar movements aiming at the establishment of dictatorship are full of the best intentions, and that their intentions has, for the moment, saved European civilization. That's not all. Murray Rothbard, trying to appeal to Pat Buchanan, literally praises David Duke in right-wing populism, saying, It is fascinating that there was nothing in Duke's current program or campaign that could not be embraced by paleoconservatives or paleo-libertarians. Lower taxes, dismantling the bureaucracy, slashing the welfare system, attacking affirmative action and racial sets aside, calling for equal rights for all Americans, including whites. What's wrong with any of that? And F. A. Hayek said in 1981, as long-term institutions, I am totally against dictatorships, but a dictatorship may be a necessary system for a transitional period. At times it is necessary for a country to have, for a time, some form or other of dictatorial power. As you will understand, it is possible for a dictator to govern in a liberal way, and it is also possible for a democracy to govern with a total lack of liberalism. Personally, I prefer a liberal dictator to a democratic government lacking in liberalism. My personal impression is that in Chile, we will witness a transition from a dictatorial government to a liberal government. During this transition, it may be necessary to maintain certain dictatorial powers. If we go on how Hayek and Friedman were connected to Augusto Pinochet, we'll be here for a while. I recommend checking out the documentary, How the Right Hijacked Libertarianism, which I'll link. It ought to be noted, though, from the evidence, it's hard to consider the thinkers associated with so-called right libertarianism as liberals, even, let alone libertarians. These reactionary views would likely not have been in good company with prominent liberal thinker John Stuart Mill, who considered himself under the general designation of socialism. But it needs to be said, this may not be you, and it wasn't me, but your movement, the movement of right libertarianism, is the alt-right. We saw this with Mussolini, we saw this with Hayek. As long as there have been fascists, there will be people who abuse and manipulate libertarian concerns and rhetoric about collectivism, the debate between collectivism and individualism itself, nothing more than a geist, a phantom to foster fear, resentment, and paranoia to promote their causes. This is no less true of Italy than of the Americas or even the USSR. More on that another time. But it's worse for you. I know many of you in your minds and hearts truly do care about freedom. I do too. But while this may not reflect your personal values, your movement, the movement of right libertarianism, is frankly not one of libertarians at all. Left libs have always had to deal with entryists, and we're pretty good about excising them because of it. But your movement? Your movement is entryist. From the fascist apologia of Mises to the praising of dictatorship of Hayek and Friedman's influence on Pinochet's dictatorship, to Murray Rothbard's flirtation with racists and racism, to even viewing democracy as inferior to monarchy of Hoppe. Maybe not you as an individual, but your movement is the alt-right. But it's not too late to join the real libertarian movement, the radical left. Join us, and finally, be free. So many of you see me as a trans leftist who insists on respect of my pronouns as something to dehumanize or fear. And you do. It's in the rhetoric you use about us. Now that I've shared my journey and gone through some logical arguments with you, allow me to open up a bit. The world you want to create, your version of free association and how you define it, is giving freedom not to everyday people, but instead to business owners, a scenario in which I would die. Why? Because while you might not like to believe this, we live in a world that simply does not like queer people. We saw what happens when just a little bit of non-egalitarian forms of free association takes place under Trump. In your world, I will be turned away from doctors, denied shelter by landlords, and denied the right to live in society as a normal person. Because how you define freedom is freedom for those with power, as I have demonstrated. And who am I? I'm the girl at the shooting range who told you which gun is the best to rent while practicing with my wife, because I too fear the day the government will force me to fight. I'm one of the three girls actually brave enough to throw Pocky at you in the Yuri room at Con. Half of you are weeps too, don't judge me. I'm your fair-weather friend. And because you don't know my life, 
you're okay with a world without me in it. I normally end this with the tagline, knock him out. But today it feels more appropriate to say, if you're advocating genocide, explicitly or implicitly, through direct force or through more implicit means, knock it off.